We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Good morning. Rafael, um, I can see you part of the um, um, speakers for the organizers for this section. Um, so since we are far behind time, can you start with us? Um, and also maybe other speakers who will be, since you have the rundown of all the session um, information that we are going. So basically we are far behind time. And if you yeah. can start for us. Okay. Thank and you very this, much. Is this the correct one, Abraham, from... Is this from the session number 77 about the rise of techno authoritarianism? Yes, please. Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. Because yes. yeah. I just sent, I sent all the, because there, there is a group of invited speakers. So I just sent them the link because I could not uh, have it. Oh, okay. not, uh, sent me. So I just okay. sent to everyone. I think they will join in one, two, two minutes. Okay. Okay. So just prompt them. I've also um, um, shared the link again. Um, Put that on the on the chat box so if anyone is involved you can invite them to join the section because we have 45 minutes to go so so that we yeah can now we can make it shorter absolutely. Yeah, yes sir okay okay and Thank what you happened very much. to the what happened to the igf website is it yeah, down so, yeah it's down but it came up again i i think they are working on it but i want to link which contains the live sections and the, um this so let me share that link to and it for that so that um, in case the website is down we can use that one to assess that thank you very much um our members on site and our online members we'll be starting very soon thank you thank you I'll just wait for one minute for them to join and double check with them by email Abraham, what is the time limit for for us to, to end? Okay, um, I think basically we were given um, um, I think nine thirty to ten forty five, um, UTC. So maybe um, let's get the speakers engaged, and maybe we can um, um, at least extend maybe basically on the time that we have to start because I think there is a a problem uh, um, with the um, IGF website, so maybe it can also delay some certain um, aspect of that. Great. So I see Kadisha is always also here. Hi, Kadisha. Hi. 
Uh, somehow I, I didn't have any trouble <laughs> logging in. I think I was one of the first people here. I just um, I got the link yesterday and I just added it to my calendar. Also, oh, it works for you. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Sorry for that, Khadija. No, it's okay. Didn't and work for yeah. us. And also Adriana and Veronica are also here. Khadija, as you saw by the email I sent to, to all the other uh, invited guests the link so they can join. And I hope some of them can join. I know Caitlin already wrote me saying she will not be able to join Tavin as well. But I will, I will introduce and we can take advantage of the fact that you are here and others and we can engage the conversation. It would be great to hear as well. So, um, good morning to everyone. My name is Rafael Zanata. I'm the executive director of Data Privacy Brazil Research Association, who is a nonprofit organization based in Sao Paulo. And we are a part of the digital rights community in Brazil. We are part of the coalition uh, Rights on the Network, which has more than 50 members in Brazil, working with the with the agenda of expanding and affirming digital rights in Brazil and working in the intersection between data protection, fundamental rights and new technologies. This conversation about the rising of techno authoritarianism is connected to one project that has been conducted for more than one year uh, about the intrinsic connection between the deployment of new technologies such as interoperability of personal data by the government, uh, the use of new technologies such as uh, facial uh, recognition te technologies or digital IDs, and how it is sometimes attached to authoritarian practices uh, that are occurring within democracies. And the biggest challenge of this project, which was conducted together with the Brazilian Bar Association and the Center for Authoritarianism and Liberty in Brazil, uh, was to understand uh, the complexity of these practices when they are also occurring within democracies. So the idea of the project was not to label uh, some countries as democratic or authoritarian, but rather to understand and investigate the complexities of these practices that are using technology and more specifically uh, personal data um, in, in the deployment of new technologies in, in many fields, such as uh, security po policies or cash transfer policies or many other policies that are being developed in the past years in countries such as Brazil. The project was basically localized in Brazil, but we had the opportunity of discussing the, pro the same problem of techno authoritarianism in different countries. That's why in July, I suppose, we had that meeting at, at the RightsCon conference in which we had participants from many other countries sharing their experiences and talking about uh, this relationship between um, how the deployment of new technologies by governments that can be authoritarian might present new challenges to fundamental rights and how can civil society react to this set of problems. We had a brilliant conversation in July and a report was published at the data privacy website. And this was envisioned as a somehow like a follow-up conversation to understand what had happened uh, during this year. Of course, the pandemics has affected immensely uh, the problems of techno authoritarianism because, uh, because of the pandemics and the need to fight COVID and to use new technologies such as uh, contact tracing technologies or uh, technologies to uh, monitor and understand the 
patterns of localization of citizens and how they were uh, moving from one place to another or if they, they were using the masks or not or if they were being vaccinated or not this also opened up a really big agenda of this conversation about uh, how governments were also using technology in an authoritarian way to fight COVID. So this is the basic context of the conversation and what is behind it. Uh, we have some participants that will be joined because we had some problem from the uh, uh, IGF website that some of the members could not join the event because they could not access uh, the, the website to add the event, but some of them are here and Khadija is also here, and I would like to ask Khadija if she could also present herself and also share her experience for a while uh, on what are her thoughts on this topic and, and the problem of techno-authoritarianism. Khadija, please. Thank you so much. Um, I'm hoping that my, you know, you can see my face properly. Yeah, yeah. it's working. Uh, thank you. So uh, my name is Khadija. I'm the lead for Anglophone West Africa Paradigm Initiative. We are a digital rights and digital inclusion or a digital rights and digital inclusion organization. You know, we work towards and I, I focus on digital rights because that's what we're talking about here. We work towards um, digital rights all over Africa from research to advocacy. So uh, the, the topic is definitely something that we're seeing more of lately. Uh, some of us might remember that in 20, as at 2019, about 19 African states had shut down the internet at one point or the other. And really it's just that, you know, a lot, a lot of them come under the guise of democracy, but it's really that uh, authoritarianism, really. So in Nigeria, where I am based, we're currently experiencing a ban of Twitter. So it, it's something that had, that was a long time coming. The government had shown, you know, itself in different ways to want to repress freedom of expression, especially. Um, 2019, 2020, there were two bills that were proposed to regulate the internet, regulate social media, and just um, regulate freedom of expression, really. In 2015, a Cyber Crimes Act was passed that was supposed to combat cybercrime. Rather, it was used as a means to chase down journalists and anything that they had put online and digitally. So uh, after 2019, when the, the bills were called the anti-social media bill, nicknamed the anti-social media bill and the anti-hate speech bill, really all in the means to curtail the internet, you know, uh, seeing how powerful technology can be scares governments you know it scares them on how much that can question their authority so a lot of the stories you would hear towards the twitter ban in nigeria was that um we so the president put out some tweets some of the tweets were reported by the people as being offensive and Two days later, Twitter was banned in the country. I, I can't say for sure that that was the origin of the ban, but it definitely fueled it for some people. And it's really that fear of technology, the fear of the power technology has. I, I've seen recently a lot of people saying that um, social media is the last tool of the common man, especially in third world countries where um, people don't get justice as it should be you know you can't just the court systems are slow you know the, the police are working directly for the government 
and you just don't find any safety anywhere except the internet. So a lot of governments find this threatening and they try as much as possible to control data, control the digital, control technology. And this has shown up in so many other ways. Another, um, another interesting happening um, in Nigeria between 2020 and 2021 was they, they we started a massive rollout of digital identity, of a digital identity program. And this is without a data protection law. We have no data protection legislation. And it was rolled out so aggressively that everyone was threatened with their phones being, with, with their SIM cards being banned and you being unable to access the internet at all if you didn't, register for this digital identity program without the government giving you know the other hand and saying hey it's okay you will do this and we will protect your data we have no idea where this data is going how long is going to be there for what's going to happen with the data who else is going to have it and every concern that comes with data protection but the the rollout was or has been um so aggressive that many people did not feel that they had a choice. And I feel like this is definitely one of the things that comes under this techno authoritarianism. So, you know, hoping that's a, a good enough background to start. Yeah, it is Khadija. Thank you so much. I will get back to you because there are so many interesting things in the way you were talking about the, the, the movement of digital repression, but also at the same time, the importance of the internet as one of the few spaces in which people can freely act and somehow mm -hmm. change things, but also the problems of the lack of enforcement of data protection and the lack of affirmation of all these digital rights. And I know you were working so much on that topic. Um, I will pass to Tevin because I would like to hear as well from him. Tech is one of the in invited uh, speakers. Um, on Tevin, how do you think about this relationship between um, the, the, the rise of this new political phenomenon, the, the rise of new forms of authoritarianism that are intrinsically connected to technology and the use of data? Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, my apologies for coming late. Currently in Kenya, we have something called the Kenya Innovation Week. So that's where most of my time is, but you can also join that online if you're interested in. So on to your question, or please, please just repeat the question again. I've kind of come in the middle of everything. Sure, I was asking, yeah. because you are a digital rights activist working yeah. in Kenya and mm -hmm. working with a coalition of many other mm -hmm. activists. Yeah. And we are discussing the problem of how sometimes the use of personal data or the use of technology is intrinsically connected to new forms of authoritarian practices that can mm -hmm. occur in mm -hmm. our uh, societies and governments. Mm -hmm. And how is your reality in Kenya? And how do you see the threats of authoritarianism mm -hmm. that are sometimes connected to the use of technology? Uh, I think I'll just give a case example of our digital ID system. Because when Kenya first, oh, sorry, let me introduce myself. My name is Tevin Mwenda. I work as a data protection fellow at Kiktanet. And when it comes to the idea of digital authoritarianism, I think to me it's, it's, it's a case of lack of information asymmetry. You see, that's what's that's making people doubt what's going on. If as a government you're not very clear with how you're using technology, the people start assuming and start making up their own stories. But if you're clear from the word go of how you're using technology from anything that you want to implement in the government for the people, it reduces the fear that this is going to create another digital authoritarianism. And I'm going to give a good example of the Kenya digital identity system, the famous or infamous Odoma number. When the Odoma number was introduced, and I'm giving a bit of a background, people say it was like snacking into the law. No one knew what this was, no one was consulted. Then towards the end of the January, a law was signed and we were told we have the new Huduma number, uh, the digital ID system, but I'll, I'll refer to it as Huduma. Huduma in Swahili means services. 
And the government basically told us, this is a new number for everything. And then the questions were raised, but we already have an identity card. Why do we need a new identity card? Why do you need to collect all this data in one place? It was crazy because at one point they even wanted your DNA data, your geolocation data. And it started raising red flags, like what is happening? Are you creating a new system where you have all this data on your people? that now may create massive surveillance. And also another question that was raised was, we recently, we just had this our Data Protection Act, so we like, what's the space of the Data Protection Act when you're introducing some of this thing? So the reaction was very swift. Typically in Kenya, people rushed, ran to court and the court was like, some things you can't implement and you have to have some form of framework to implement a digital identity system. And what followed was the government now passed our Data Protection Act. Actually, people always laugh. The Data Protection Act was as a result of the digital identity system. And this was trying to look like, no, you're not creating a digital authority and government. But all through, it's been marred with a lot of court cases, one court case after another, with the most recent one being you have to have a data protection impact assessment conducted in the entire system to ensure that the, the people's data is safe and it's not being misused. So I think that's a good example of how I think the citizens are actively now becoming aware of how much data the government has on them and they're kind of on a panic. And you see this panic mode came as a result of not really informing people of what exactly is happening and why you want all this data there's already existing data. And perhaps now what we're starting to see is Kenyans are becoming more aware of how government uses data. And another good example to give is elections. You know, elections are becoming, uh, data is being used a lot for elections. And like in Kenya, we saw the issue of Cambridge Analytica in 2017. You know, and the argument is even in the Kenyans upcoming elections in 2022, it's going to be a, a data-led election. So, and I think one thing now people are realizing, and we are happy now we have the Office of the Data Protection Act, a commissioner that's actively now, I remember the Data Protection Commission was talking and saying, we need to kind of enable capacity building and inform people of their rights. And see the more people are informed of the rights that they have and the things that they can do in terms of data, I think the more they start trusting the government. So I think what is lacking is that lack of information asymmetry. But I think this requires more input from every stakeholder, from civil society, to private sector, to government. We all need to sit at the table and be like, these are the projects you're working on. Because for example, like digital ID, we can't say digital IDs are bad, no. Estonia is a perfect example of what digital IDs can bring. But if it's not properly implemented, that's when the trouble starts. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Tavin. And it's, it's great that you mentioned the, the case of digital ID in Kenya, because there's also so many commonalities with other countries, such as Brazil, for instance. Um, Brazil had, in the first year of the government of Jair Bolsonaro, who is a mm -hmm. uh, well-known uh, right-wing politician, mm -hmm. he proposed the, the citizens' um, registry. It was called the National Citizens' Registry, which was mm -hmm. the unification of all the databases from, from more than uh, 40 uh, public policies from different mm -hmm. ministries in a unified system that could also collect uh, biometric information such as fingerprints, the f mm. uh, face information, but also the way mm. you walk mm. And, mm. and many other, uh, they even, mm. they're, they're also interested in gathering information about your voice print mm. uh, uh, so they can have many proxies so they can mm. check the identity mm. of one person uh, mm. and the and the explanation they provide is that they mm -hmm. want to be more efficient when they are providing mm -hmm. public policies, when they're executing yeah. public policies. Pretty yeah. much the same uh, rationale behind the mm -hmm. Aadhaar case in India mm -hmm. and the National Identification Project when mm -hmm. it occurred many, many years ago. So mm -hmm. we can also see that how in, in different countries some of mm -hmm. the rationales and the arguments are the same and mm -hmm. some, mm -hmm. some of the fights are also the same. Um, yeah. But they can take different uh, courses of actions. Like in mm -hmm. Kenya, as you mentioned, the court case was very mm -hmm. successful mm -hmm. in connecting the discussion about the right to privacy mm -hmm. with the more recent discussion about uh, making mandatory to have a mm -hmm. data protection impact assessment, correct? Yeah. yeah. And that's how, that's how you, you won the case, at least mm -hmm. by now. Um, yeah. 
let me let me uh, go back to Khadija because I want to connect with her and also understand because I know that Khadija, you have mentioned that many of the problems in Nigeria, at least uh, from what I know as well, uh, reading uh, everything that is published by Access Now and other uh, activists working and looking to Nigeria, are the problems that you mentioned about um, internet shutdowns, but also taking down, removing uh, content and removing uh, profiles and profiles from Twitter or from Facebook and etc. cetera. Uh, Tavin mentioned another dimension of problems, which is the, the dimension of um, monitoring and identifying the citizen constantly through digital ideas projects. Um, looking to your current scenario, I would ask you, what is the biggest challenge regarding uh, authoritarianism in your country? Is it the problem of internet shutdowns or control of, of, of uh, content? Or do you also have problems regarding these new forms of digital IDs and the deployments of these technologies to catalog and monitor the citizen constantly? Um, I, I think it's definitely a lot of things. So I wouldn't say it is surveillance per se, because um, so we, we know that there is massive surveillance going on. We just don't exactly have a lot of evidence around it. So every, every year when uh, parliament passes the budget, there are huge, huge amounts that are dedicated to surveillance. In 2021, I think, uh, I cannot remember the figure exactly. I think about 7 billion Naira was passed for um, surveillance. And I remember we sent a freedom of information request asking what exactly, because the, the report we saw on the news was saying that the surveillance was specifically for platforms like WhatsApp and Facebook. And, you know, we were asking what is the basis of such surveillance? Who are the people that you're going to be surveilling? Would you need a warrant for that? Uh, um, and it was met on deaf ears and we just never heard anything back on that. So we know that surveillance happens, but as to the intricacies of, of the hows, the whys, we have no idea. Also, still same in 2021, about May, thereabout, a new um, SIM card policy was published by the Ministry of Digital Economy, Communications and Digital Economy. Uh, and the, the policy asks that the how is it called? The IMEI number of every phone would be registered in a singular database. And, you know, if you're technologically inclined, you would know that it pretty much means they can trace every single mobile phone for no reason. So <laughs> it's, it's a scary thought because um, they would tell you that it's, this is because of security, and we, we have had a lot of insurgency issues, but if there are no rules as to how this is done, again, no data protection legislation, we have no idea how far this could go. We could, they could easily start to chase political opponents with that, or a journalist who says something that isn't agreeable would suddenly disappear. And we've had situations like that. So again, things like that do happen, but we don't know whether it came directly from such surveillance. But the fact that these little things are out there and are happening is something that we should definitely be concerned about. And it is why it is why we, we keep pushing for a data protection legislation. And we really thought we we're very close this year. Um, last year, there was a draft bill. We made a lot of input into it and then in November of this year, the federal government calls for consultants to draft a new bill. So this would be the fourth attempt at a data protection bill. And for whatever reason, it just is it never goes on. Um, 
so yeah, we have it's it's the the I, I have a I have a friend who calls um the 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 minister of digital economy at the moment an emperor because during the when he first when he joined he got a lot of the major technological agencies under his belt and then it stopped that way it stopped every um aspect of independence of these organizations so let me just um <laughs> let me break that down so the agency that is in charge of the digital identity project is now under the ministry of digital economy the agency that is supposedly to protect um data so there is a data protection regulation but it isn't in legislation and doesn't have as much power that agency is under same the same ministry so you the um national communications commission those in charge of telecommunications and all of that are also under the same ministry so everything under technology is pretty much under the same person under the same umbrella so it's all uh, very politically inclined. All their, um, all their 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 policies are always in line. Um, the agency that is supposedly supposed to protect people's data or check data breaches is in cahoots with the same organizations that are breaching said data. So. For us, it's a lot of institutional, it's a lack of institutional independence. As such, there can be no enforcement of whatever regulation there is. So we're really just here waiting on an actual legislation that would allow us to be able to go to courts and enforce some of these rights. So we don't exactly have um, what uh, Kenya had with being able to go to court in that way. So a lot of what we would do would be taking from different laws to imply the rights to privacy. So the constitution gives the rights to privacy, but it specifies um, telephone communications and something about your household. So this constitution was written in 1999. So it's very outdated as to what privacy looks like today. You know, I imagine they didn't imagine what the internet would look like in 2021. So, you know, it's also the, the lack of laws, the lack of institutional independence, the surveillance. I, I could <laughs> go on and on. The problems just, they go on. Yeah, it's very interesting um, that you have mentioned that there is this kind of uh, enormous hope from activists that data protection will solve many of our problems. Sometimes they will, sometimes they will not. What occurred in Brazil was, was quite interesting last year was that in the middle of pandemics, uh, when Bolsonaro, he wanted to use all the data from telecommunication operators to do research on what was the impact of the pandemics on people, especially the economy and uh, family problems and so on, because um, as you as you all know, Bolsonaro was one of the few presidents in the world that was against uh, vaccinating people in the beginning. It was also against um, the whole idea of COVID and the pandemics. And he was really desperate to get data on how the pandemics was affecting people's economy and economic lives. So uh, he could make an argument that he needed to keep the uh, stores open and let, let people on the streets and so on. So what occurred was that there was a window of opportunity because he edited uh, an executive act like a, a federal decree so he could get all the data from uh, the telecommunication operators to the government and that was the moment when the brazilian bar association filed the constitutional case and when many activists jumped into as amicus curi and the supreme court ruled this very important case making a clear separation between uh, the right to privacy and the right to data protection as an autonomous fundamental right and declaring that the right to data protection was much more about 
um, reducing the risks to citizens when the government wanted to, do, to use uh, personal data for secondary purposes, uh, when it did not have accountability or impact assessments or mechanisms for social control. So this was a very important case in which the court was one of the few spaces we, which we could count on um, to counterbalance this uh, more authoritarian approach of the federal government. So it's interesting that we can perceive as well, having all these conversations during this year, that we are also uh, looking to courts as one specific like political side, so to speak, in which we can uh, counterbalance this problem of authoritarianism. Um, I will uh, ask from, from uh, folks who are on, on, on site, and I can see you all here, um, and, and thank you for being with us and, and, and sharing your moment with us. If you also want to make one comment, or if you want to um, make a question or a comment based on what you think about the relationship between the rise of uh, techno authoritarianism and, and the problems of digital rights we are discussing here. Abraham, can I just o open the, for the microphone for them? Yes, please. So we can currently um, give an a floor of, um, for the on-site members to also come in. If, if there is, then I will just spotlight them on the, on the screen. Thank you. All right. So let us see if they are comfortable with making one comment or and question, then we, we can, can hear them. Uh, hi, Rafael. Uh, hi, Khadija. Hi, Tevin. Um, I'm Vladimir Cortez from Article 19 um, from the Office of Mexico and Central America. And I was listening to Khadija and what she was like mentioning uh, about this uh, same registration and email registration. And it just like uh, gets in connection of what we are seeing in, in Mexico. Just recently, they passed this uh, bill, this legislation to also uh, create this uh, same registration, but now they are including biometric uh, data. Uh, there is an ongoing process to litigate. There is uh, uh, this belief that still the judiciary power will make this counterbalance and will uh, put in place uh, data protection and how uh, the risk and, and the vulnerabilities and how this may affect the right to privacy, the uh, data protection, even the National Authority on, on Transparency and, uh, uh, and Data Protection in, in Mexico, they also present an, uh, a controversy, uh, an action of unconstitutionality. And we're going to see how they are going to, uh, to react to, uh, to this. Uh, many citizens, also thousands of citizens, they also pushed for the judiciary power to uh, interpret or to make a, a decision on how this idea of thinking that security, or that's at least in the context of in Mexico of, of violence and how they are like framing and saying, now we're going to collect, imagine about like 80 million uh, numbers and uh, biometric data, ear, iris, uh, voice, uh, fingerprints, and so on. We're going to centralize in, in, in one database and that is going to be our main argument, or that's their main argument to tackle and to reduce uh, violence. We have an, an, a prior experience in which this uh, idea of a centralized uh, database for SIM registration failed. Uh, numbers showed that uh, the extortions and uh, kidnappings uh, for using mobile phones, they actually raised. So, now we are seeing, and we have like first uh, uh, through different uh, civil to civil rights, uh, civil society organizations, we create this campaign, we raise awareness. People were like really questioning this idea of like security versus uh, privacy. We're not now expecting what is going to be the decision at the uh, at the Supreme Court in in Mexico. And my question for, for Khadija and, and perhaps to to the others, it's like, uh, is it just like uh, uh, thinking that uh, the uh, judiciary power is the only way uh, in which we still believe there is a, a way to protect 
uh, human rights, a way to protect uh, uh, privacy, or we should also like start preventing. And because I'm seeing this in Nigeria, but perhaps that's going to be somewhere else. If there are like other routes, other ways of like uh, connecting and uh, raising awareness, uh, awareness in, in, in one way, but perhaps like thinking also in other different uh, uh, ways to try to reduce this uh, techno authoritarianism wave that we're seeing in Latin America, but I think we're going to see in the rest of the world and as emerging uh, technologies is coming, uh, are coming up. Thank you very much. No, thank you, Vladimir. That's excellent. Thank you for bringing all this really important information about the Mexican scenario. Uh, Khadija, I think the question is mostly directed to you, so I'll pass to you. Yeah, um, I think it's it's so great to, well, not great, but on some level, uh, I, I suppose it's nice to know that we're not alone and it's easier to relate with people from other countries knowing that um, we're experiencing some of the same issues and we can throw out ideas on how to fix them or mitigate some of these things. So, you know, the, the court is very commonly called the last hope of the common man. I feel like it's one of the biggest, biggest ways to fight authoritarianism, um, assuming the courts themselves do not end up being politically inclined, because that is also a possibility. Um, at least we know that they are guided by these laws, and very often it's difficult for you to arrest the politician or stop them from making certain policies. So really the only way that it can be stamped in law would be to go to court. And it's why we do what we call um, strategic litigation, right? So sometimes you know for a fact that you're not exactly going to win the matter in court, but the fact that it is there, the fact that you have um, spoken against it, shaken them up a bit, called their bluff, we've seen that work sometimes. We had a matter with the digital identity um, institution in Nigeria where they had to get your NIN number. It's very um, similar to a social security number in America where, you know, it has all your biometric information and you could use a person's year of birth and last name to get that number through a USSD code on your phone. So it is very easy for me to Google the, the year of birth of the president, really. Put his last name, because everybody knows it, and then his NIN number pops up on my phone. We tried to reach out to this organization to say, hey, um, this is very risky. And they did not respond. So we took it to court. And even though the moment we took it to court, they fixed it. <laughs> So before it got to the end of the matter, it wasn't an issue anymore. So the, the court eventually just made a pronouncement saying it, it, what we did was necessary. There wasn't anything to, to adjudicate on anymore because the matter was gone, but it was necessary for us to have done that. And it, it pretty much made a declaration telling them to respect privacy going forward. Also, when the matter of the IMEI number came up, where the government wanted everyone to register the, the IMEI numbers of their mobile phones, there was a very, very public outrage. You know, there, there's a lot of distrust for governments these days, and people were not having it. And then um, the government came out to make a public statement and eventually that didn't happen anymore. We did eventually get to find out that they could have gotten it from um, the telecommunications companies themselves, but the public outrage worked. And with us in Nigeria now, our next general elections are next year uh, in 2023. 
So lots of the politicians are pandering to the people and really any outrage is working. So it is, we cannot take away the role of civic participation and just people being a part of political processes. One of the reasons why things just anything goes is because people, especially younger people, are not part of political processes. Um, a policy comes out, no one reads it until something bad happens and or, or a law comes out, a law is passed, uh, the, the period where the people are supposed to participate and make um, make their own suggestions, contributions, nobody does that. The parliament is empty, no one is a part of it until the point where something goes wrong and you realize it's a part of the law. It's just like the when I was mentioning the Cyber Crimes Act and how it's used to chase down journalists and bloggers, if we were more attentive, it might not have happened. It might not have become a law in itself. So yes, um, going to the judiciary is up there as far as I'm concerned. The only issue there is they can be politically inclined and it takes too long. We are currently in court for the Twitter ban in Nigeria. And for we have about four matters in court one where we sued the telecommunications companies, one where we sued the federal government, one where we're in the regional courts with ECOWAS. And a lot of these matters have not even been heard. We've not even opened, it took us about two months to get a date for hearing, the, the hearing dates, the judge was not around, and now it has been pushed to January. So um, before we could possibly get justice, a lot of damage would have been done. But ordinarily, in the best case scenario, um, the judiciary is and should be the last hope of the common man. But before then, I, I would, the next best thing for me is civic participation. So yeah, hoping that um, that was clear enough. Thanks, Khadija. I was reminded here that we just have two minutes. Uh, Tevin, would you like to make any really sh uh, sharp and quick comments regarding Vladimir's question? Uh, I, for me, I think Khadija has kind of done the, the whole job, like my job. Because Kenyans nowadays have become very litigious. We, we realize actually the courts are on our side. And I think that's thank you. We, I'm thankful because of our constitution, because our constitution is relatively new, the 2010 one. It's very robust on human rights. And you find the courts are very proactive. Sometimes it's not even a case of, like, for example, when it comes to data protection matters, they're already enforcing right to privacy, even before we had a data protection act. And that's because of our constitution. So you find in most cases, the court kind of becomes the last resort of hope when everything fails. And if people tend to start trusting the court, if they see that they can have a favorable judgment that's upholding human rights. And that's something I think we've seen a lot in Kenya. And not only in the digital ID case, you also have our Cyber Crimes Act, which coincidentally is almost like the Nigerian one, which was crafted to kind of favor the politician. So you realize you've never prosecuted anyone from an actual cyber crime, like something like phishing attack, but we are forever seeing bloggers being arrested, journalists being arrested. And in most cases, it's after they say something that is perceived going against the government. And remember, that's a court case. That's a case that's still in court, and that's because of our cyber crime act. So you find the courts actually actively, kind of trying to work with for the people, but also in what she's talked about. I think there's an obligation for people to laws, and as a if you're a citizen, you're not aware of the laws that are currently passing. It becomes really hard when a law is finally passed for you to kind of try to overturn it. So I think we have a responsibility from civil societies to generally the citizens to participate in the process from when the law is actually starting, be part of the drafting. When the government is calling for input, be part of it. So that even if the court case is passed, and let's say you go to court, this will be this will be this will form part of your evidence. Like you know, we submitted our requests, they were ignored, all this and this happened. So I think it's now a, a case of everyone has to be part of it. Yeah. So thank you very much. Thanks, Savin. Thanks, Vladimir, for your question, and thanks you all for, for being here. 
Uh, we have to finish this conversation. Sorry for uh, ending up so, so quickly, but this conversation will continue. This project will, will continue next year. And as Khadija said, it's so good that we can be together and talk about the same problems. We do not, we do not feel alone anymore when we're doing that. So thank you all. Thanks, Abraham, and, and all the team from IGF for uh, hosting on and, and supporting this conversation. OK, thank you. Um, Rafael, and thanks to all on-site participants as well. We are very sorry that we started a late, um, very late um, to that, and uh, we hope to we hope you enjoy the sessions. And basically, there there, there is a connection um, um, that you can connect with the moderators and other um, um, participants on the IGF scheduled website. So um, basically, you can um, connect with most of us on the website. Uh, for um, interactive or for further um, um, communication. Thank you very much and have a wonderful um, day. Thank you. Thank you all.